The following interview was conducted with Ardna L. Bemen, Jr., Chief Global Affairs Officer Emeritus for the Purdue University uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, May 6, 2013 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerit of Library Science. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Bemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> the, your appointment as the inaugural director of the Global Policy Research Institute and Chief Global Affairs Officer was in June 2010 after serving as director of the National Science Foundation from 2004 to 2010. You're also the David A. Ross Distinguished Professor of Nuclear Engineering and head of the School of Nuclear Engineering. Guilty as let's, charged. <laughs> <laughs> the, let's start off talk, by talking a little bit about the Global Policy Research Institute, starting with its background and how yes. it was founded. Uh, when President Franz Cordova developed her strategic plan, she convened uh, several faculty committees all of whom, all of which identified a public policy research institute as a need for the university in order to meet the goals of the strategic plan, uh, discovery with delivery, and especially meeting global challenges. Uh, so this led to a pol public policy institute task force uh, chaired by Ambassador Curiel and when the work of that task force was completed and its report submitted, the next step was to develop a business plan to sell the concept to the Board of Trustees, and that led then to the formulation of a business uh, plan task force, some of the same members involved. And then when the uh, uh, task force made its representation and it was accepted, uh, then, of course, I was approached to become the inaugural director. And that was in, uh, I started on June 1st, 2010. Okay, good. Um, what was the vision and some of the key characteristics of this? Yes, the uh, Public Policy Research Institute was designed to in, in, encompass the core capabilities of the faculty uh, to address challenging global issues, uh, to develop an education program, both an undergraduate program and a master's program in policy, public policy, and also to provide not only outreach for the, f for the faculty at large and students and staff through uh, workshops, uh, conferences, and seminars, but also to the public at large through uh, a website and through publications sponsored by the Global Policy Research Institute. And so that was the way we got started, and that's what we've been busy at for the last oh, two and I a half you years. Have <clears throat> right. What are some of the um, key characteristics? Uh, you have some global concerns, I think, that in agriculture. Yes. Um, th there are many universities that have policy centers. Uh, many of these I was gonna, are. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, but many of them are self contained. They have a staff, and they do the policy work. There are very few that in, uh, are embedded in the core of the faculty or that uh, tap the core of the faculty. Uh, the other thing is that uh, many of these uh, focus pretty much on state policies. Uh, some also focus on national policies. But uh, very few uh, deal with global policy issues mm -hmm. and deal with them in terms of doing rigorous research and analysis. And of course, that's where the faculty comes in, is to sure. do that research and analysis. Um, the, the other thing is, in, in, our, in the survey of the business team, they found that um, most of these policy institutes had at most maybe two or three particular themes that they specialized in. But since we were dealing with faculty capabilities, it was important to leverage the strengths of our faculty in many areas to include agriculture, food safety and food security, uh, energy sustainability, environmental sustainability, economic development. We have um, uh, the nation's top agricultural economics uh, department, uh, health, okay. uh, security, uh, both homeland security, uh, national defense, uh, but especially cybersecurity where we're well noted uh, through our Sirius uh, Center. And then finally, uh, uh, society and leadership, uh, looking at some of the social components. 
in, in many of these studies, it's important to recognize the interrelationships among technical factors, social factors, and economic factors because they're all interwoven. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the way we go about our work and that's the way we focus our efforts. Okay. Are the other institutes, are they affiliated with academics primarily? Or? Oh yes, I think they're, I wouldn't want to hazard a number, but probably over a thousand university-based uh, policy sure. institutes. Um, most land-grant universities have policy institutes that focus on state, right, I see. state okay. uh, policy issues. Okay. Now the location to, uh, for the research reports, it's located close to campus. Yes. Right. Uh, we were very fortunate at, at about the time that the task force was uh, developing its business plan, uh, the Shoei House was donated to the Purdue Research Found, uh, Foundation. Uh, this was uh, owned by Anna Sho uh, Tom, Thomas Shoei during the time that their daughter was attending the university. When she got her degree, they, uh, they left and went back to California. So it was uh, off the market for two or three years, and uh, they decided to donate it to the Purdue Research Foundation. And so these two uh, efforts came together naturally. The Shoei House would become then the uh, the home for the Global Policy Research Institute. Okay. Let's back up a little bit on the business plan. Were you involved at all, or was that handled done before no. you came? Uh, much of the work by the faculty was concluded, and the okay. approval by the Board of Trustees obtained before I was approached by President Cordova. Okay, all right. Uh, staff and funding, a little bit about that. Uh, the university provided uh, two years upfront funding. Uh, since that time, because of the success of the institute, they've also provided recurring funding. Okay. In the meantime, we've been very active uh, soliciting uh, private gifts uh, for uh, developing a found, uh, found uh, I'm sorry, an endowment, and also to support special programs of the institute. And so the uh, the institute is financially sound. Yeah, that sounds good. Some of the act, let's move on activities and programs. Let's talk. You've done some. There have been some presentations that you've given, certainly to the president's forum. And uh, one was at that seventh annual meeting of the science and technology in Japan. So the institute has done some presentations. Well, okay, that uh, that gets to my personal activities. Ah, um, okay. But the, as a as a representative of the institute, what's the involvement? Well, some of these were uh, obligations that I had uh, uh, I had made before I left the National Science Foundation. Uh -huh. Okay. So for about a year, I was quite active and engaged uh, and engaged in international activities. Since sure. that time. Uh, most of my international engagements have indeed been uh, in support of or GPRI or representing GPRI. Sure, okay. Um, the, GP, um, the GPRI awards, you gave some in February of this year to study food and health issues. Can you talk a little bit about those awards, how they come about? Yes, yeah, so right at the very beginning, uh, the faculty identified the need to engage a, a broader number of faculty in policy activities. There were... Across the campus? Across the campus. There were five or ten that are, were quite active in policy work. They wanted to expand that to a more representative group. Uh, furthermore, there, because these are, are very complex issues and mm -hmm. pretty much at the systemic level, it requires, because of the complexity, uh, interdisciplinary research. So it was necessary to engage other schools and departments than had been uh, uh, traditionally involved. So we, uh, they identified a faculty incentive grant. They call it a seed grant. We call it an incentive grant because we expect that out of this incentive grant, there'll be larger grants that will uh, result. And starting uh, even in the first uh, summer, we had our first solicitation. Um, at that time, there was no particular specific field identified, but we did require that it have a policy objective, uh, that it was dealing with, a, with, a, with an issue that was within the scope of GPRI, that it be interdisciplinary, that there had to be more than one college or school represented in the research. And uh, ideally, it would also involve international participation. 
Uh, so that's a tall order. Mm -hmm. A little bit later, we also require that in some of these incentive awards, we increase the amount of the award from about 40000 to about 50000 um, we, we also require that not only the technical factors, but the social and economic factors also be addressed in the course of the research. Mm -hmm. um, um, ideally, that would involve economists and social scientists. And that was our expectation, but in some cases uh, there are engineers and scientists who are also very savvy on social sure. issues and also economic issues. Right. Uh, so that, is, that has been a very successful program. We've given uh, grants in three categories. One is research incentive grants. Another category is the development of policy briefs. And these are of, of two types. Uh, technology informed policy briefs and policy education briefs. briefs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the total number of faculty incentive awards for uh, research awards have been around 16 or 17 to date. Uh, the um, uh, policy brief awards have probably been around 10 or 12. And then uh, we've also sponsored workshops, about six to eight workshops mm -hmm. over the past two and a half years. Right. So those three categories are where we uh, invest our, right. our okay. faculty funds. All right. Yeah, you mentioned, I was going to ask you about the policy briefs, and there was a, an incentive and award solicitation for policy briefs, yes. and you mentioned that yes. just a moment ago. That's yeah. right. All right. Partnership with the Oh, incidentally, I should also emphasize that oh. in our coursework, we also ask for term papers, and some of these are outstanding. So we also put on our website student papers okay. that uh, are, are especially excellent. Yeah, okay. Uh, the partnership with the College of Technology. Well, we have partnerships with uh, various uh, schools and okay. uh, centers around campus. If you take our seven thematic areas and, and account for all the centers that are affiliated or sure. are, are linked to those, those particular themes, there are about 40 centers. Um, at Quite Purdue a bit. University, so we established a formal relationship, uh, collaboration with each of these centers. Yeah. Okay. That uh, many of these centers are in Discovery Park, so we have a working relationship with Discovery Park, mm -hmm. and we co-sponsor a number of events. But uh, among the schools, we have very strong links with School of Technology, School of Agriculture, School of Engineering, uh, a less, to a lesser extent, uh, liberal arts, and uh, also. Uh, uh, School of Science. I, I should put liberal arts up equivalent to the first first three because okay. they are very strong contributors. Right. And you taught a class, uh, wasn't you and Dr. DePew, I think I read something, you had some peop students from the technology. There was a press news release I happened to see that you were talking to some of the students from the uh, seminar course. Well, the School of Technology has introduced uh, an area of concentration, a certificate okay. program actually, a certificate uh -huh. program in uh, policy related to uh, information security. And so that's at the graduate level. Sure. And uh, since that time we've developed other courses in um, uh, certificate programs in, in specific fields of, of uh, uh, science and technology. Oh, okay. That sounds good. Um, the, uh, what about some, some conferences? Well, no, I'm sorry. Right. In specific issue areas of public policy, not just science and, and engineering, but <laughs> right. in social science and, right. and public policy. In liaison with what you're doing, Correct. right? <laughs> um, you had that policy research for a changing world, a great, and we had a conference that you sponsored. That yes. That um, sounded very interesting. Uh, we have an annual conference. We, uh, we established right from the beginning an external advisory committee or council made up of very high level people, uh, some at ambassador rank, uh, some at corporate CEO or senior vice pres president rank, and um, uh, some at uh, sub cabinet rank in, in the federal government. Uh, we wanted people as well as international uh, sure. leaders. We wanted thought leaders, but we also wanted people who were familiar with policy, how it's made, uh, who were policy uh, makers themselves to serve as an advisory group to the uh, uh, GPRI. We have at least uh, three teleconferences with the members of the adv uh, advisory committee during the year. And then we have an annual meeting in April each year 
So we've now had three annual meetings. And at the time of our annual meeting, we also schedule a Global Connections uh, lecture, a lecturer, a distinguished lecturer, which we've now named the CNR, CNR Rao Lecturer um, as part of our Global Connections lecture series. And this year it was Norman Augustine, who was uh, CEO of Martin Marietta, and then later uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, but who also was the uh, chair of the, of the uh, very famous study now of Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And so he gave a very interesting lecture. Mm -hmm. Our previous lectures included Ambassador Oliver, Ambassador Washer, uh, Dr. Sig Hecker, who is an authority on nuclear nonproliferation, especially in North Korea. And I may be leaving someone out. No, that's, I was going to, uh, since you mentioned the, um, your advisory committee, that was one of the questions I was going to ask, so perhaps you, this would be a good time to just make a few comments about the, your advisory committee, external advisory committee. Uh, well, I, I, I won't go into the individual names no. because there are about no, 20, no, no, just 23 what? or 24 members on the committee, but uh, it is a very active group. Um, How often do you meet? A couple times during the year? Well, that's what oh. I indicated earlier. We okay. have three teleconferences a year and then an annual meeting here on mm -hmm. campus. Okay. Okay. And you interact during the, during the year, though? That's correct. <laughs> right. At their request. <laughs> um, then uh, could you talk, make a couple comments on that uh, you're invited, the lecture series that you have? Uh, you have a invited lecture series, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, as far as uh, seminars and lecture series, uh, some of these we co-sponsor with other centers. Okay. Uh, but the one that is our showcase lecture series is the CNR RAL, CNR RAL lecture series, lecture, distinguished lecture that is uh, conducted in, in connection with our annual meeting okay, of right. the External Advisory Committee. And some of the names I mentioned earlier are names of our lecturers. Do you have any lectures, uh, any, uh, lectures during the year, or is it normally just the one that in April? Do you have any others, any others during the year of the lectures, the institute? Uh, we usually have about uh, two a year. Okay. Um, these are all videotaped. Uh, they're all available on our website, and uh, in many cases, the written text is on our website. Okay. So they're available openly to the public. Okay, that's fun. And they're they're quite worth reading. <laughs> I'm, um, let's see, um, the Master of Science in Public Policy and Public Administration is that? Uh, uh, that was place? in the business plan. Okay. And uh, that was there for the reason that uh, there was such a master's program about uh, ten years ago that um, did not continue for lack of student interest. Okay. Um, we've had that in mind, but we thought we would start with certificate programs first. Okay. And then broaden that into areas of concentration, and then eventually, once we've developed the, uh, the uh, faculty and the student interest, we would then expand it into a master's program. Mm -hmm. So that's still on the horizon, but uh, we're taking it step by step. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, and I, one thing I was going to ask you about college and university, but you already, already mentioned that there are similar institutes, but not the same as the one that, that's here. Okay. Um, I, I should say, incidentally, we've also sought uh, interaction with other policy institutes. Uh -huh. um, uh, we have a, a working relationship with Notre Dame and, uh, University. Uh, we've had uh, periodic uh, connections with the Chicago, Chicago Council and uh, also with Rice University. Uh, Neil Lane, who is also a former director of National Science Foundation, is connected with that public policy institute. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that these are robust yet, but uh, there's a desire to make them right. so. Right, okay. Um, talk about a couple of your awards and honors, since I should mention that this is part two because we did an uh, interview earlier. But the um, honorary, you had some honorary doctors. You got the Legion of Honor with the rank of Chevrolet from the French Republic. Yes, that's Tell right. Tell us a little about that. Um, well, actually, I've had two international uh, awards. Um, 
One is the uh, Imperial Order of the Rising Sun from Japan, which was presented by right. the, uh, the Emperor of Japan. And then the Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur, uh, which was uh, uh, presented by President Sarkozy. Um, yeah, those were very uh, prestigious awards. Let me, how did you hear about, do, do they notify you in advance? I sometimes ask people and they say, sometimes it's kind of a sword prize. Uh, it, it works that way. Uh, uh, in both cases, I received a letter saying that I had been uh, selected, uh -huh. usually six months in advance. And um, in the case of uh, the Order of the Rising Sun Award, I did go to Japan and I did receive that from the Emperor. That's very good. In the nice. case of the uh, Légion d'Honneur, I received that at the French Embassy in Washington. Uh, did, what about that board of trustees, you're on the board of trustees of this, I cannot pronounce it, the S-K-O-L? Uh, Skokovo? Yeah. Well, I have two responsibilities. One is I'm a member of the Science Advisory Council of the Skokovo Foundation. I should have mentioned that Skokovo is the name of a city, a town actually, Okay. on the outskirts of Moscow. And it's uh, the site of a developing research park, a business development center, and, and a, a, a science and technology institute. Uh, so this is uh, intended to be Russia's answer to Silicon Valley, <laughs> to be um, uh, a stimulating place where inventions and, uh, and, 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 and new business startups mm -hmm. can occur. Emerging. And also to train special uh, students at the graduate level in becoming innovators and entrepreneurs. And so that's the purpose of what's called now Skoltech, uh, okay. which, uh, which is the uh, Skokovo Institute for Science and Technology. Yeah. Okay. That's so great. in addition to being a member of the uh, Science Advisory Council to the um, ch chair of the Skokovo Foundation, um, who happens to be pre uh, pri uh, Premier, Prime Minister Medvedev at the present time. He was president at the time it was established. Sure. I'm also serving as um, a member of the Board of Trustees of Skoltech. Okay, very good. Um, associations, now the, um, on the Chinese Academy of Science, you're an honorary member of the graduate. Yes. Faculty. That's correct. Have you, do you meet, do you have to be over there or how did I, I gave a, I gave a keynote lecture there a couple okay. of years ago. Could tell us a little bit of research, what's a little bit about the academy that might help? Well, well the Chinese Academy of Science is similar to our National um, Academy of Science here in the United States with the uh, sole exception that it's much more like the Russian Academy of Science which is made up of a number of uh, scientific institutes which are federal institutes. In our country, we have national laboratories. <laughs> there they have national institutes which are part of the foundation. So uh, I don't know exactly how many institutes they, they have, but probably somewhere between 20 and 30. That uh, There's probably more than that, but I'm talking about world-ranked uh, institutes. And they, they also have a graduate school, which is uh, very selective. They bring in uh, the very best uh, students in the country for graduate training. And uh, so I was uh, um, made an uh, honorary faculty member that, of, of have that you been uh, over there? graduate school. You, have been, uh, I, I, I don't go over there very often, but I correspond. Okay, that's, that's a nice thing. Um, and you're a fellow also of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Yes, Which is that's very right. nice. We have quite a few others that have been on there in just a recent Well, there are, two, there are two AAASs, and I'm a fellow of both. One is the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the, the other is the American Association for the Advancement, the Advancement of, of Science. Advancement of Science, right. <laughs> the AAAS, right. AAAS. <laughs> um, hobbies and special interests? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, I have been an art collector over the years. In fact, uh, most of my collection was donated to Purdue University, so they're they're hanging in various parts of the campus. Um, I'm an avid reader of biography and, and uh, history. Um, I'm a philatelist, a stamp collector. Sounds I have good. a couple areas of, of specialization. 
And that keeps me uh, occupied. It certainly does. Something I read said uh, Renaissance Man. Uh, well, I don't know. That's that's perhaps uh, a little bit. Uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting. Uh, overreaching. <laughs> but it is true. I like true the Renaissance that, uh, anyway. <laughs> it is true that I have a, a broad range of uh, interest in the. Uh, in the social sciences, but also in the arts and humanities. Uh huh. Okay. Um, outstanding event. I think perhaps the most recent outstanding event was the uh, family reunion last summer and the occasion of my 80th uh, birthday. Where was it held? For me. Where was it held? It was held in um, Estes Park, in Colorado. Okay. At the uh, YMCA camp. How, was, how large about, was the gathering? Uh, 60, well, at, at the present time, there are about 82 members on my family tree. <laughs> and about 60 you of them You got a lot of fruit up. on that tree. <laughs> yeah, about 60 of them showed up, so that was, that was very good. We had a very wonderful time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, how about the next stage? The post you're going to be uh, in post GPRI. What's the next stage that you're going to be doing? Uh, well, I anticipated uh, retirement. Actually, um, I was um, I was offered the position of inaugural director for for two years. I like the it, word inaugural or founding. I think it's a very good it's you know, a very good adjective. Uh, help get it up and, and running, and I stayed on an additional six months during the transition of the presidency, uh -huh. and then I uh, became emeritus on January first. And in a single day, I went from distinguished to extinguished. <laughs> but um, uh, it turned out that for the last year, I've been taking on other areas of interest, uh, writing a book, uh, and, and this will be one of maybe more books yet to come. Okay. Uh, I've become active on boards, two university boards and one corporate board. Okay. Um, I've re, re, uh, reestablished activity within the National Research Council and the National uh, Academy of Engineering. Uh, while I served in Washington for, for o o almost a decade, uh, because of conflict of interest, I couldn't participate. But now I can reactivate sure. uh, my interest in uh, public policy. I'm chairing. Uh, uh, I'm a chair and a co-chair of two study committees at the present time, actually three, uh, two for the National Research Council and one for the uh, Na uh, National Academy of Engineering. Okay. Um, and I'm a reviewer of other studies, so I, I keep quite busy. Okay. Is uh, anything I forgot to ask or anything you'd like to add as you look on your look ahead and, and uh, anything in general that you'd like to say that I forgot to ask? Well, I, I would say that uh, my um, my affiliation with uh, Purdue has been nothing short of great in the time that I've been here. Uh, when I was with TRW before I came to Purdue, I had the responsibility of investing the TRW Foundation resources for universities um, by giving grants. And at the time I started with TRW, almost all the grants went to universities in California. And I broadened that by including other universities like Georgia Tech, Purdue, uh, Ohio State, Rensselaer, Polytechnic Institute, uh, MIT, um, University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that allowed me to become acquainted with Purdue. And oh, by the way, the Ross Gear Company is here in Lafayette, which is, was part of TRW at that time. So I had occasion to come here on business. So I, I, I came very well acquainted with Purdue. And I, I have to say that uh, it stood out among almost all the other universities that I um, engaged with, not so much because of its academic Strengths, although they're they're quite quite sure. high, but the other ones were very high as well. But I think in, in terms of how the university is operated, it's it's operated much like a, a solid business. Um, it runs well. Uh, the campus is always neat and trim. Mm -hmm. The students are clean cut, 
And um, uh, many of these students are the first in their families to a right. attain a, um, a degree. And it's the only university that I've lectured at where I had students at the end of the lecture come down and say thank you. And that made a lasting impression on me. So when I was yeah. offered the position of uh, professor in right. uh, both the uh, School of uh, Materials Engineering and also the School of Nuclear Engineering, I jumped at the chance. Good for you. That's very nice. Uh, anything we, I think we, do you think we got it all covered? Everything we, I forgot? There's no way you can cover everything, but. Uh, oh, I know. I we think, don't want to. We have to save some for I, part I, three. I, I think we had uh, <laughs> many of the highlights. Thank you, <laughs> Catherine. Oh, Dr. Grimman, I want to thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. My yeah, pleasure. So this, this is what I would call a movable feast. It, it has <laughs> been a movable feast. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh.